Amen. Praise God. I titled this morning's ris- uh, message, Have You Seen Him Since He's Risen? Now let's go to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to read verses 13 through 35. We're going to go ahead and read this long passage of scripture. It says, and behold, now this is after the resurrection of Jesus. I just want you to be aware. It says, and behold, two of them, that means two of the disciples, uh, not the original uh, 12, but, but but the broader perspective of followers of Jesus. Two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass therein these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher, another word for tomb. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ To have suffered these things, you know, real quick, just I don't always like to interject while I'm reading, but I think it's important that we understand that the word Christ means Messiah. It means the anointed one. The idea of what these Jewish believers would have understood that they would have understood that for thousands of years, the prophets. And that's what Jesus was saying. Oh, you foolish and slow of heart. Do you not remember what the prophets have foretold that the Christ ought to have suffered? In other words, there were so many prophetic words that had been given through Jeremiah, through Isaiah. Isaiah says that he was he was pierced for our iniquities, that that our transgressions were laid upon him, that he suffered for us. The psalmist David said that he was pierced, his hands and his feet were pierced. We're talking hundreds of years, thousands of years before Jesus ever was born in the flesh. The word of God spoke of the fact that he was coming. And so Jesus, as Messiah, he's saying, "Did, did, did you not know that these things should have happened? And so he goes on to say, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew near unto the village. Well, wouldn't you like to have been in that minute of that, of that conversation in that Sunday school lesson? Jesus preaching about himself from the Old Testament. Boy, that must have been powerful. Amen. Yeah. And they drew near unto the village where they went, and he made as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him. It means that they restrained him. They said, no, stay, stay with us, saying, abide with us, for it is towards the evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them. That means in the King James, basically, he sat down to eat with them. He took bread and blessed it and broke and gave to them and their eyes were opened. I want you to see that. He broke the bread and their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying, the Lord is risen indeed 
and has appeared to Simon, and they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. You know, the resurrection of Jesus, it means so much to our faith. It's really hard to communicate its importance. Amen. Immediately in the early church, I want you to know that when you read in the book of Acts and you read the, the early uh, messages that were preached by the disciples in the early church, there was a lot of emphasis on the resurrection. I mean, if you can only imagine the miracle that they experienced, you know, I mean, they're, they're sitting here walking with Jesus and talking with Jesus. And this isn't a fairy tale, guys. The, 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 you know, this is the word of the living God. And, and they walked with him and they talked with him and they watched him perform miracles. They, they literally watched people that were dead raised to life again. They watched him feed the multitudes. Hallelujah. Amen. They watched blinded eyes opened and they watched people that were infected with leprosy be healed. And they and they saw they watched the lame man at the pool of Bethesda and they said they saw that Jesus said, "You know, will you be made whole? Rise up and carry your bed and walk out of here." Amen. And they watched all of these miracles day after day, time and again. And they sat and they listened to his messages and it was so real to them. And then you start to notice in the book, in the gospel of John, when it nears the end that they become concerned because now his tone is changing. His, his message is changing. And he tells them things like it, it, it must happen that the son of man must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. And he talked about the fact that he would have to go to the cross and they just didn't understand it. They didn't understand the, the whole picture. It's so easy for you and I to look backwards, right, on where we've come. And we, can, we have the whole book now, really, to, to believe. And there, there's not gaps, in, but yet they were living it. And, and they didn't understand it all as it was unfolding before their eyes, right? And, and, and so whenever, whenever he, he, it, it goes that he, he excuse me, it, it, that he was going to die and, and, and that he would be raised from the dead. And, and whenever it happened, it was so powerful that this message of the resurrection was so on the forefront of their minds and in their hearts. And, and they began to preach about the fact that he rose from the dead. Amen. You know, early on in church history, it was reported, if you, if you read about church history and you read about the church fathers, about the way that so many of them died for the faith. They died for the faith. And, and you know, the, the story goes that whether it was uh, Peter, you know, some people would argue with this, but this church, church history says that Peter was crucified upside down. He said that he was unworthy to be crucified like his master. So he asked that he would be crucified upside down. The, the church history also speaks of the fact that, that Mark, who, who wrote the gospel of Mark, was drugged through the streets in Egypt behind a chariot driven by horses until he died. The, the story goes of doubting Thomas, if you will, that he ended up in the country of India witnessing and evangelizing that country and that he was run through with a Brahmin Indian sword and he died for Jesus. And the story goes with all of these belief, all of these disciples that were martyred for Jesus, and all they had to do was just change their story. That's all that the governments were asking them to do was to just change their story, just recant what you said, just take back what you said about the fact that he rose from the dead. Just, just change the story, deny the fact that you saw a risen Savior and you can go back home and you can be with your family and you can have dinner tonight with your children and everything can go back to normal. But they refuse to change the story. They refuse to change the story because, oh, thank you, Jesus, because to change the story would have been a lie. It would have been a lie to the authorities. It would have been a lie to the world. It would have been a lie to all believers that would ever come. And they knew that they could not lie because there was truth that resided on the inside of their hearts. That's a right. truth that they, while they could not completely understand it, while they could not completely explain it, it lived on the inside of them. I know what the scientist says. The scientist questions everything. He, he talks about so many things that are so far beyond. The Bible says in the book of Romans that their foolish heart 
Because of their foolish heart, they instead chose to serve the creation rather than serving the creator. I'm here to tell you this morning that when you get a hold of the real Jesus, Come on, somebody, help me out. When you get a hold of the real Jesus and when you're willing to receive him by faith, it requires faith to receive Jesus. Amen. Intellectually, somebody can't talk to you enough about it. They can't speak eloquently enough to convince you in your mind that Jesus is real. No. It requires the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit through the word of God to reveal to the heart of man that Jesus is real. Oh, but preacher, I don't understand. I see this one do this, and I see that one do this, and I see people living a life that seems different, and even people that profess Christianity don't do what it is they're supposed to do. Hello, none of us in this room have done what we're supposed to do. There's a real devil out there that wants to destroy people's lives. He wants to destroy people's lives, and he wants to make the message null and void. Just as he wanted to cause these disciples to change their story, he wants you to change your story. Amen. The enemy of your soul is just alive today is what he was then, and he's wanting people to shut their mouth. And he, let me tell you something, especially people that preach the gospel. He wants to destroy them. People that witness Jesus, he wants to destroy them. Amen. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm here to tell you he's alive. He's just alive today as he was then. He lives in my heart. He lives in your heart. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he ever liveth to make intercession for you and I. I'm here to tell you. They would not recant. They had something to talk about. They had something to believe in. Jesus was alive. Hallelujah. And he was on the inside of their hearts. The death and resurrection was so real to them that they would not die because once again, it would have been a lie. You know, I want you to know that the biblical, there's a biblical significance to the resurrection. I mean, it's so, the resurrection is so important. I, I remember whenever I started to get a revelation of the cross, I almost started to, to overcorrect things <laughs> to the point where I was like trying to like act like, not, not, not trying to act like the resurrection wasn't important, but... I think that people misunderstand the significance of the importance of the resurrection. I'm talking about people that don't maybe have a revelation of the cross. The revelation of the sacrifice of Jesus. Yeah. Resurrection is just as important today as it was ever. But the point is, is that many times people have flipped the importance over to the resurrection. But let me tell you something. Without, without the cross, there is no resurrection. You see, you got to understand something. Without the obedience of Jesus at Calvary, there is no resurrection from the dead. Because without the cross, there's just disobedience and death. With the cross, hallelujah, the resurrection proves something. I want you to see this right here. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 17. This is the Apostle Paul. I'm talking about scripturally the importance of the resurrection. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. In other words, if Jesus never raised, I'm not done yet, but let me just stop for a second. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then this message that we're preaching this morning is vain and it means it's empty. It's void of any power whatsoever. If, this, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, the preaching is vain. But not only that, your faith is vain. Yeah. Your faith is empty. You wasted your time. You wasted your time putting on your shirt and, and putting on your... By the way, some of y'all look really sharp this morning. But, but, if, but if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, the reality of it is, is that we're wasting our time. This isn't some... What do we do? We showed up over here for a social gathering? The reality of it is we got other things that we could be doing. It's a beautiful day outside. We could be riding around, we could be at the park, we could be doing all kinds of things. But the reason that we showed up is that somewhere inside of our hearts and our minds, we believe Praise that God. there was truth. Right. Hallelujah to this story. Apostle Paul said, if Jesus didn't raise, our preaching is empty and your faith also. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God. Wow. Yeah. Our testimony isn't true. <sighs> Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not, 
For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain and you are yet in your sins. Oh, somebody else, somebody help me right here. See, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then you are still dead in your sins. Now, some people would misinterpret that as though the resurrection expiates or paid the penalty for sin. That's not what the Apostle Paul said. See, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The payment for sin took place at Calvary. Amen. Jesus, the gift given by the Father. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And God allowed the sin of mankind to be laid upon the righteous one. And there he died as he hung naked on the cross and the humiliation and ridicule and the world laughing at him and the religious leaders laughing at him and tormenting him as he died and even was even forsaken for a moment in time as the, as the father had to turn away from him because of your sin and because of my sin. But oh, hallelujah, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's why he rose again. Why did he rise again? Because the fulfillment of the sacrifice was completed. See, in the Old Testament, when they would put the sacrifice on the altar, the Bible says that God would consume it when he'd lick it up with fire. <laughs> that fast. Just like the fire of God come down from heaven and consume the sacrifice. Jesus resurrected from the dead because the sacrifice was completed. The sacrifice was accepted. And because he rose, you too will rise if you're in Christ. Amen. And because he rose, you can know that he paid the penalty for your sin. And while the devil might lie to you and whisper in your ear and remind you of all your failures, Jesus whispers another story. He says, but I died for you. I bore your sin upon my back at Calvary. And I and it's truth and fulfillment of the scriptures that the Father accepted the offering that I gave. That's good news this morning. Good news this morning. Hallelujah. Resurrection life in Christ. We'll go back to the story that we read. Point number one is we can't see because we have a hard time understanding him. See, that's what I titled this morning's message. I titled this morning's message, Have You Seen Him Since He's Risen? And that's point one. We can't see because we have a hard time understanding Him. Yeah. Anybody give me an amen on that one? Amen. Preacher's willing to admit I have a hard time understanding my Jesus. Yes. I've been reading the Bible a whole lot for a long time. <laughs> and sometimes I still have a real hard time understanding yes. my Jesus. Yeah. Luke 24, 16, out of the text that we read, says this. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Some translations say their eyes were kept from seeing. The word holden in the, in the Greek language, it means this. To lay hands on someone in order to overpower them. The idea here is that God overpowered them and prevented them from being able to see Jesus for who he really was. Yes. Listen to me. There's a lot of times in our walk as Christians that we cannot see completely or properly the things of God. I don't have time to get into all of that right now, but many times it's a test of faith. The Lord will allow you to go through a test of faith because he's wanting you to persevere. He's wanting you to, to choose him and he's wanting you to walk with him and he's wanting you to trust him in the midst of it all. But sometimes the Lord allows scales to be over our eyes to where we cannot see the way that we would desire to see. Their eyes were holding from being able to see him. There was a power that held their eyes and prevented them from seeing the risen Savior for who he was and what he had really done. You know, this is a common occurrence. It happens to Christians where they can't see what's really going on. A lot of times we can't see what's really going on because you know what? We expected something different. Yeah. We just were expected something different. Yeah. And our desires are so oftentimes different than what God was doing. These Christians right here that are walking to the on the road to Emmaus, I'm telling you, we're about to look at it in a second. I'm about to break it down for you. They were expecting and looking for something different than what happened. 
It didn't go down the way they planned. It wasn't really conducive for their life. It wasn't what they wanted. And so when God did what he was doing, they were caught off guard. His love and his ways are so different than ours. Right. I hope you know that this morning. I don't think that I'm talking to a bunch of hyper-religious people that think they've all got it all figured out. I would sure hope not. Preachers stand here before you and look you right in the eyeballs and tell you he ain't got it all figured out. Amen. <laughs> but I want to get this point across. His love and his ways are so different than ours. Amen. It's so hard sometimes for us to see him because our humanity, yeah. or really I guess I should say our flesh, mm -hmm. is so far from him. Mm -hmm. I want you to see this scripture in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. I think that this is literally one of my favorite scriptures. And you can't really get, appreciate it from the surface reading of it. You have to kind of dig into the original language to really, to really be able to in, enjoy what it's really saying. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that with you in a moment. But this is what it says. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Now, I want to just stop for a second because I can remember a time in my walk. Now, if you've ever been overwhelmed by the love of God, then you know what I'm talking about. Yes. I could probably stop right now and even quit preaching and we could have said we had church and, and, and y'all could go home. But, but, but sometimes people in their walk have not yet experienced that. Right. Where they've literally been overwhelmed by the love of God. You should not feel less than if that hasn't happened for you yet. But what you do need to understand is, is that there can be a place in your life where you will be overcome and overwhelmed by the love of God. But what you got to know is, is that many times that is preceded by great pain. Yes. In order to come to the place where you would be overwhelmed by the love of God, it's got to be something that you really, really want. And really, really need. And I can remember... After the death of my sister and I was in so much pain and I can remember thinking about how far away my life truly was from the way that it should be. And I can remember after the Lord began to pour his presence on me and I was experiencing Jesus in a way like I had never, ever experienced it before. The presence of God was so thick and I couldn't even, I couldn't stay asleep. Like at first the Lord would speak to my heart. He would say, seek me early and you will find me. And I mean, this went on for two weeks. The Lord would speak to my heart. Seek me early and you will find me. But Lord, you know I'm not a morning person. I like to sleep. Like, seek me early and you will find me. Listen, I don't have time to go through all the details of what happened. But after about three weeks in of seeking him early and I will find him, I would start to, this is the coolest thing. I would start to set my alarm at a certain time, and the next thing you know, like I start setting my alarm earlier every day, five o'clock, four thirty, four o'clock, because it was like I couldn't get enough. And then the next thing you know, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna set my alarm at four o'clock. And the next, thing, and all of a sudden, it was like I swear I was sleeping, and I felt a brush on my, I felt like I felt a brush on my feet. I don't know, I was sleeping. I'm just telling you what I felt like I felt, a brush on my feet, and I woke up, and it was like ten to four. And the Lord was like wooing me. He was saying, come and seek me. And when you seek me, you will find me. And I can remember one morning when I was up seeking the face of God. And I was worshiping the Lord. And his, his love was just overwhelming me, man. Look, look. When you grow up, to be, when you grow up a, a man, and especially in a home kind of like where I did, where my dad was like overly tough. You know, he's a Marine, a leatherneck is what they call him. You know, you don't talk about love, and especially not love from a man. I mean, it's just it's kind of weird. But I'm here to tell you that. That there ain't no love like the love of Jesus. Oh, and I was being overwhelmed <laughs> by the love of the Lord. And I can remember when I prayed this prayer. And so that's why part of the reason this scripture is so special to me. I can remember praying in King James language saying, what manner of love is this that you've bestowed upon me? I have never experienced anything like this in my life. It's like I've been searching all of my life looking yeah. for something. And this yeah. is what yeah. I was looking for the whole time. And so here we are with this scripture. Yes. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not. You know, whenever you're going out there in the real world and people see you and they think you're weird. Uh, the Bible says you're a peculiar people. I mean, I'm talking about if you're really living it. I'm, I'm, and I'm not talking about just religion. I'm talking about you out there and the topic of your conversation is Jesus. 
I mean, you know that's what the disciples were like. Mm -hmm. The topic of their conversation was Jesus. Not how I'm going to go, oh yeah, I got a date with my honey. I got, you know, I got this going on. Or, you know, talking about things that are having to do with the world. And no, no, no. Their topic of conversation was Jesus. Their love of their heart was Jesus. They were, they were controlled by the Spirit of God to do the will and the work of God. And when you begin to live and allow Jesus to live through you, sooner or later, people start looking at you a little bit cross-eyed. <laughs> What manner of love is this that he has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Yeah. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Lord, purify us. Yes. Purify our hearts. Purify our minds, oh Lord God, that we would desire to walk with you. I wanted to explain to you real quick. We're talking about the fact that, that sometimes we can't see because we have a hard time understanding him. I wanted you to understand that this word manner right there, where it says, behold, what manner of love is this? And I've shared this with the church many times. But I'm going to share it again. This, the idea in the Greek language is this, that it comes from another tribe. If you looked it up in the Greek, literally it would say another tribe. What is the idea behind it? The idea behind it is that it's foreign. See, what I need you to understand is that God's love is foreign to this earth. Yeah. God's love is foreign to the human mind. Amen. Man's mind thinks certain things, and even at his best, when he thinks he understands God, his understanding of God and his understanding of God's love is very, very foreign to his natural flesh and his natural being because it's opposite of who he is and what he is. Right, right. God's love is foreign. It comes from another place. God's word is foreign. You know, I remember whenever I used to go to the old church, and I'm not, I doubt that they would watch any of my videos. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. But I can remember one time that some one of the leaders in the church said, you know, the, your kids are over there in the youth group, and they're getting preached in a language that they understand. And the preacher said, wiki, wiki, wiki. <laughs> and I can remember thinking to myself, what is that? What is that? What, what kind of language is that? No, you know, and people say, oh, Matt, whenever you preach, nobody understands. Nobody understands what you're preaching. And I started to think, and I'm not trying to say anything of myself, but one of the things that I felt like I prayed before was, Lord, make me speak Bible fluently. Lord, allow me to learn the language that you've given mankind. Sometimes people don't understand whenever you're speaking in a language that they don't understand. I'm trying to learn Spanish right now. It takes some work to learn another <laughs> language. When you walked into class on that first day and you saw the teacher right on the board, X equals two. I don't know about you, but I wanted to like cover my eyes and walk out because I'm like, really? How do you mix numbers and letters together? What I'm trying to say is, is that God's love is foreign. God's language is foreign. Hallelujah. But he's here to communicate his love to us. Amen. And he wants us to be able to see it. His love is foreign. It comes from another place. See, when we first get saved, there's so much of the world that's still in us. And our understanding of God is contorted because of how we view life from what we've always known and expected. We, we interject our own past into That's what right. we understand about God. Yeah, that's not how God wrote his word. Right. No. God's love and plans and word come from somewhere else altogether, separate from this fallen earth and life that we were born into. And he's given us a whole book that explains his character, his Amen. ways, and his love. But it's not just a book that you can just sit down and read and then you automatically understand it. No, it's a book that must be read. It has to be read. But in addition to being read, it must be lived. And as you live the journey of this book, this love letter that he wrote, guess what? There's failures. There's failures and there's tragedy, but there's also triumph. And as you live that life out and you experience the failures and you've experienced the tragedies and you experience the triumphs, the word of God becomes alive on the inside and mixed with the Holy Spirit, it begins to give you revelation and you're able to see, hallelujah, and you be able to understand the kind of what manner of love is this? Oh, Lord, that a cheater like me, a person that would go against you. A person that would think the wrong things about 
culture. Yeah. A person that would go his own way even though he knew better. Wow. That you would still love me. Yeah. Listen to me, there comes a place in your life and your walk with God whenever you get a revelation of what manner of love is this that you want to give love back to him. That you don't want to cheat on him anymore. But that instead you want to live your life for him. And then it's like he in the garden with the father and he says, Lord, I don't want to do this, Lord, but nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done, oh God. Amen. Your will be done. Yes, Lord. Yes. We got to get to the place where we're, where we're willing to lay down our own will. Right. Yes. Where we're willing to lay down our own self. Where we're willing to give our heart and love yes. to Jesus. Yes, Lord. You know, the Apostle Paul knew better than anybody that it was easy to misunderstand God. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 through 9. It's kind of a long passage of scripture, but in the beginning he's talking about, he, he, well, let's just read it. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. He goes on to say, for we are the circumcision. Now, let me just tell you a little background. I didn't plan on getting too deep into this, but... The Apostle Paul, when he says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the concision. That word concision in the Greek is a play on words, and it literally means the mutilators. So I, don't, I didn't really plan on getting too deep into this, but I'm going to go ahead and say the mutilators were going around telling the new church that they had to be circumcised in addition to Jesus. How you equate that for the modern church today is, is that anything that you add to Jesus and what Jesus has done. Yeah, you receive Christ, but now you got to da 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 in order to earn righteousness. No, Jesus is righteous. He gave you his righteousness as a gift. Amen. You can't add to nor can you take away. And they were over here changing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul even, the Peter even at one time had a revelation when they had a council in the book of Acts. Whatever he said, why are you trying to put on these Gentiles things that you and I couldn't even do? Lord, help us. Try to make a bunch of rules and regulations for yourself. Oh, I'm going to read this much Bible this day. I'm going to make it to church every time. Please come to church so I don't have to preach to myself. The point, though, is this. You can't earn your righteous standing with God. The Sabbath isn't you showing up on Sunday to go to church. The Sabbath is that Jesus is the fulfillment of your rest. Come unto me, you who are upon you for my burden is easy hallelujah and you will find rest for your weary soul Jesus is Sabbath so that's what Paul's talking about worship him we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh though I might also have confidence in the flesh can I tell you that there's still preachers today that have so much confidence in their flesh true so much confidence in their flesh. Oh, they got their little network of buddies. They like sit there and they like, we got to go on, oh, man. This is, and, and I hate to say it, but the reality of it is, is that they're completely missing the point to the scriptures. Yeah. I don't want to get into that. He <laughs> says, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Why? This is what Apostle Paul saying about himself. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You know what he's saying? You want to talk about somebody exalting in their flesh? You want to talk about somebody doing ministry, man? I was doing ministry. I had it going on. Dude, look, you just, I, I, I'm of the stock of Israel. I know which tribe I'm from. I'm, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised according to the law on the eighth day just the way it was all supposed to be done and I was on the fast track to being a Pharisee he said he was a Pharisee of Pharisees actually he says yes he says but what things were gained to me those I counted loss for Christ what is it that you've been trying to hold on to in your life he says, yeah, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. Dung. A pile of poop. You know, I think about sometimes, you know, so many different things that, the, that, that, that go on that, that mankind perceives to be important in life. Yeah. 
You know, sometimes I think about, I'm very grateful for the turn that my life took. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I probably don't have time to get into all this, but I can just remember being a high school dropout, man, on, this, on a stolen BMX bike, <laughs> riding down the road, looking for somebody that had a, we called them doobies back in the day, so I could just get a little high going on. And I would seek out the buzz, <laughs> And my life was just going nowhere so fast, and I was just being destroyed. And I thought that that was what life was all about. And then, you know, then Jesus, hallelujah. And then Jesus, and then, and then you know, I don't know, God put me on this fast track to where, I mean, I, within months I had my GED. And next thing you know, I was in nursing school. I graduated with honors. Next thing you know, I was in nurse practitioner school. It was just a blur. Everything just went by so fast. Yeah. And I had a master's degree, and now I was working as a nurse practitioner. And sometimes I look back, but you know one of the things I realize is that when it comes to what man perceives as important, Right. It's really nothing but a pop of dung. Because right. right. the Bible says, what do it profit a man if he gained the whole world, but at the same time he loses his own soul? Right. Amen. Anytime anybody would say to me, oh, look at where, no, 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 no. You don't understand. If you knew me the way that I was, you'd be jumping up and down and giving glory to God. You wouldn't be trying to give no glory to man because I was a high school dropout. I was broke, busted, and disgusted. I had no desire on the inside of me to accomplish nothing. It was only the Lord that showed up and breathed life on the inside of me. So I'll give him glory. I'll give him honor. But to be honest with you, all these accolades and all this other kind of stuff, I ain't never even got them diplomas framed because, you know, and I'm not saying I shouldn't, but I'm just trying to say, it's all a, it's a it's a pile of dung when it right, compares right. to knowing Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. The apostle Paul had learned through hard times that what he thought he knew about God was all wrong. He was full of spiritual pride. He was raised in the law and doing the action of religion. And when faith came. I said, when faith came, he had to be humbled in order to be able to see what true Righteousness was, you know, anybody remembering the story of the Apostle Paul when he was going to Damascus to get letters to imprison Christians? What happened? The, the power of God struck him down and blinded him. I know well, I'm talking about spiritual blindness right now. We can't we can't see him because we don't under, properly understand him. The Apostle Paul, yes, he was physically blinded, but I'm here to tell you that so oftentimes that is the problem that we have. We cannot see him because we don't understand him. We need a revelation from him to be able to properly see him. That's what the Apostle Paul prayed. Look at this, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. The Apostle Paul said this, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith. So he's writing a letter to Christians in Ephesus. And he says, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's my prayer for the church this morning. Hallelujah. And for myself, that the Lord would give us wisdom and understanding in the knowledge of him. Look at this part. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Did you know that your understanding had eyes? <laughs> He's talking about your inner man right there. Right. He's talking about your spiritual man. That your spiritual man's eyes would be opened and enlightened and that you'd be able to see the things of God. Because if you got a revelation of the things of God, amen, then it would help you navigate this physical world a whole lot better than what you've been doing in the past. Amen. Amen. That you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. His prayer was that the eyes of the spirit man would be able to see. Open our eyes, Lord. Amen. amen. That was point number one. We can't see him because we don't understand him. Point number two is we can't see because it's not what we were looking for. We can't see because it's not what we were looking for. Look at this verse. We're going back to our original story. Luke 24, 21. These are these two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. Y'all just try. Hey, this is, this is resurrection Sunday. Y'all give me some, come me some slack, man. Give me, a, give me a few minutes here. It says, but we trusted. We're talking about these disciples. But we trusted that it had been he 
which should have redeemed Israel. So they're sitting here and they're walking down the road to Emmaus. Jesus has died on the cross. They kind of heard maybe he rose from the dead. Jesus is actually walking there with them, but they can't see because their eyes have been blocked. And they're talking about Jesus and they're like, but this is the problem. We thought he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. You see, even last week, Angela made a comment in her preaching on Palm Sunday. You remember that? She talked about the fact that Jesus rode into town on a donkey. Remember? Mm -hmm. And remember, you could get a picture, man. Jesus riding into town on, the, on that donkey and the people laying down palm leaves. Hosanna! Hosanna to the son of David! Time out. The word Hosanna means save now, like we were taught last week. Mm -hmm. But you know one of the, under, the things that we got to understand and we got to wrap our mind around? They weren't, le they weren't looking to be saved from their sin. Right, they were looking right. to be saved from their situation. Right, right. Rome was their master. They were looking back at the Old Testament prophecies that said Israel would be elevated once again. And that they would be restored to their former place. That's why they were calling him. They knew that he was of the lineage of David. But they were like, oh, son of David. God promised that there would be a son of David that would sit on the throne of Israel. We're tired of being in bondage to Rome. We're tired of being enslaved. We're tired of being looked down on and people making fun and, and treating us improperly. Oh, he's here to save us. Right, right. The problem was is that he wasn't here to save them from Rome. Come on now. Oh, he's coming back again. The Bible says he's coming back again. He's coming on a white stallion. There's going to be a sword that comes out of his mouth. And with his word, he will smite the nations. It might sound sci-fi to you. It might be hard to believe. But I believe everything up to this point, And I believe that he's coming back again. And he will cause confusion to the wise. And those that have felt like he would, that his word wasn't true, they will be sorry on that day. Lord, help us. Help us to be convinced today. The Bible says that there's coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed it. And I'll pray it again this morning. Lord, let me bow now. Lord, let me bow now. Let my knee bow now. Let my tongue confess. Lord, let me see it. So that I not, so that I not be confused in the end. Lord, I, I, I want to bow now. I want to surrender now to your lordship, to your kingship. You know, I've been thinking about, I don't know why I'm thinking of this, but I've been thinking about God as a chess player. I don't know how to play chess. I, really don't. I don't want to take the time to learn. But I believe that people that know how to play chess, it's really cool. And I just imagine God playing this chess game. You ever felt like you were in a chess game? Like, in other words, you're over here manipulating your moves, thinking out your strategy. And all of a sudden, I don't know what this really means, but I saw it in a movie one time. <laughs> Knight to Rook 7. Checkmate. <laughs> and you know what they do? They knock their king down. Dude, there's a message in that. They knock their king down. They surrendered their king. The Lord is looking for us to surrender our kingship to him. He's looking for us to bow our knee and to give ourselves. Don't play chess with God. Oh, you're going to do it. We all do it. But God is a master chess player. And there's going to be a day when he's going to say, Knight to Rook 7. And the only move to make is you're either going to rebel against him or you're going to knock your king down and you're going to surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. God wanted somebody to hear that. And that just been a word for me. <laughs> Amen. Knock your king down, boy. Man looks externally. You know, we're sensual creatures. I think of this kind of stuff all And when I say sensual, I'm not talking about lust and lying with somebody. That's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about senses. We look, we hear, we touch, tactile, right? Auditory, olfactory senses. We smell, we taste, we feel. You get the point I'm trying to make. And we experience the world that we live in through our senses, right? And so oftentimes we allow what we experience externally to affect us our decisions in the spiritual realm. Our decisions that we make for God. Somebody help me out here. Lot and Abraham. I love that story. I'm not going to turn to it, but I'm going to tell you real quick. There came a time in Abraham's life. If you remember Abraham from the Old Testament, he was called by God. And through him, God made the nation of Israel. His nephew Lot journeyed with him. It came a place in time in their life. That they both had such large herds that they had to split and go their own way. Right. Remember that? The Bible says that Abraham looked at his nephew Lot and said, Son, 
why don't you just go ahead and pick which way you'll go, and I'll go the opposite way. The Bible says that Lot looked on the plain of Jordan and that it was well watered. I don't know what exactly that means. I'm just imagining they were up on a bluff somewhere. He looked in the plain of Jordan. It was real green. The grass was green and it was waving as the wind blew. And he was a herdsman. So he needed a lot of grass to feed his sheep. That's a no-brainer. I'll take the plain of Jordan. The Bible says that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Abraham, on the other hand, see, was not making decisions based on his senses, what looked right, what seemed right. No. Abraham had been given a promise by God. Amen. He had been given a promise by God that says, from you, I'm going to make you a people. From you, I'm going to make you a nation. And from you, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Trust me, Abraham. Abraham had a promise on the inside of him, a promise of eternity, a promise of destiny, a promise from God. And based upon that promise that he had from God, he made his decisions and he trusted God. But Lot instead made his decisions based on what felt good, smelled good, tasted good. Listen to me. Be careful. The enemy will bring things in your path that look good, smell good, taste good, and even feel good. But it doesn't always mean that it's really from the Lord. Amen. You know, we will always be faced in this life with two choices. One, will we choose what we're looking for, that we're expecting something else, or will we choose God's will? Each and every day that you live your life, each and every situation that you face, this circumstance and situation will arise in your life. You're going to have to make a choice. You're either going to choose, I didn't write the book, he wrote it. It's not me saying it, it's him. There's going to have to be choices that will be made, decisions that have to be made that sometimes don't feel good to our flesh. Sometimes it hurts to serve the Lord. But his word is clear. And the Spirit bears witness with it. Hallelujah. The Spirit is always leading and guiding us toward the truth of His Word. But sometimes it's not what we wanted. It's not what we expected. And we right. stiffen our neck and we harden our hearts. Yeah. And our stubborn heads. We're like mules. The Bible says in Psalm 32, Don't be like a horse or a mule, which will not come with you to you without bitten bridle. I can remember when I prayed, I was like, oh, Lord, I've been like a mule. Please, Lord, don't. But if you got to, go ahead and put the bit in my mouth. If that's what you got to do, Lord, I'm sorry if I'm that stubborn and stiff neck. But if you got to do it, go ahead and put the bit. You ever seen a horse, a big, strong horse? And you're like, they're over there like trying to, I mean, and that horse is just that big old neck muscle pulling back, right? That's sometimes how we can be. Lord, help us. Help us just to give in. Yes. Oh, I bet you there's freedom in giving in. Don't you think? Just, just give in, man. All right. Number three, last point. We can't see the power of the resurrection until we receive a revelation of his death. Luke 24, 30 through 31. It came to pass as he sat at meat, in other words, he sat down to eat with them, that he took bread and he blessed it, and he broke it and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. I want to also read to you verse 35 again. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. Now I can't prove this to you and I want to take communion with you whenever service is over. So y'all just sit tight. I can't prove this to you, but the scripture is real clear that through the breaking of bread in some way, shape or form, revelation of who he was became clear. The thing that kept their eyes from previously seeing the power that had overcome them was removed in the breaking of bread. Now, the easy thought is, is that he reached out there and he broke the bread. And when he did, they saw the nail scars in his hands. I suppose that's a possibility. But truthfully, spiritually, whatever happened in the breaking of bread, they began to realize that it was him. The point that I'm trying to make from a spiritual perspective is that you'll never truly understand the power of the resurrection until you get a revelation of his finished work on the cross. You know, one of the truths that God revealed to me about his sacrifice is that there's a death side to Calvary. 
There's a death side to Calvary. And this is the old man that was born in Adam. He's dead and he's unhappy. There's a death side to Calvary. You understand what I'm saying? Like, there's a place having to do with the cross that the old man born of Adam, the first birth of Adam, the first birth of sin, there's a place whenever you come to Christ where you die in Him. But I got to tell you that there's also a resurrection side of Calvary. The Word of God teaches that on the other side, there's life. And that in Him, hallelujah, you are in Him. And that there's now access to the resurrection power of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, it talks about that. It says in Romans 8, 11, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies, by His Spirit that dwells in you. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to you in your, in your life. We're talking about spiritual life here. Yes, there is a resurrection to come. There is a day that even if you die on this earth, if you die in Christ, the Bible teaches that you will rise just as He rose from the dead. But I'm talking about today. I'm talking about today that even in the midst of this life and this journey that we live, sometimes we feel the death of sin creeping down our doorway. I'm here to tell you that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. There's a resurrection power side of Calvary. There's resurrection power for you and I to have access to. Thank you, Lord. The Apostle Paul talked about this in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. Manny, would you do me a favor and start passing out that communion stuff? If you don't know where it is, you can ask. Uh, yeah, Manny. Yeah, well, both Manny's. That's good. <laughs> it says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, that I may know him. Talking about Jesus. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means... I might attain the resurrection from the dead. The scripture says being made conformable. This word is made up of two words in the Greek. Sin morpho. It's where we get the word synonym and then where we get the word morphology. Which is a fancy word that means form. That we would take the same form of. We would take the same form. See, just as he died when we put faith in him, the Bible teaches that we died with him. We were, according to Romans chapter 6, verse 5, you can put that up there real quick. We were planted together. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Thank you, Jesus. You know, a lot of times, yes, yes, thank you, sir. A lot of times, we, uh, we talk about the substitution. The substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus. What does that mean? He was our substitute. We were guilty, but he died. In the garden, Adam and Eve were guilty, but the innocent animal died. There was a substitute. But sometimes we don't think about the identification part. See, sin, synonym, <laughs> the same form of. We, we need to understand what the Bible teaches that in the mind of God, when we put faith in Christ, in God's mind, the old man that we were born like Adam dies with Jesus. The devil doesn't want you to give, get a revelation of that. I can, I can tell you about that all day long, but if the Holy Spirit gives you a revelation of that and the cloud of guilt is removed from yes. you yes. and the condemnation is removed from you, Hallelujah. I'm telling you right now that it's a whole different walk. 
And it's a whole different situation that the devil doesn't want to deal with. Right, right. Because now we have a person that's actually walking in the freedom and liberty of what Jesus came to the cross to set them free from. When that cloud of guilt is removed from you, the thankfulness and the gratitude that you would have towards the Lord would give you a desire in your heart to live for Him and to do things for Him in such a way that it wouldn't be necessarily about you anymore, right, right. but that instead it would be all about Him. Amen. I remember one time when I was preaching at the church in Franklin. You know, Matt, you keep saying that it's not about me, but I thought that Jesus did all this for me. I'm like, hey, you know what, brother? You're right. Jesus did all this for you. But there comes a day when He wants you to realize that it ain't all about you, bro. It ain't all about you. This whole, there's a big old planet that we living on. Whole lot of souls out there. Whole lot of hurting people. And it's time that we come to the realization, sometimes, at the right time, that it's not all about us. Yes. Amen. Yes. But yet it was all about you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, it might be hard for us to understand the old life that of sin that brought death but new life in Jesus brings eternal life I know this has been a little bit of a long message but I wanted to close it out with two different stories from the Old Testament then we're going to take communion Okay, I'm not going to read them, I'm just going to talk to you about them I just felt like the Lord put them in my heart and so I just want to share them with you real quick in 2 Samuel 13 there's a story of two of Dave, King David's offspring one of his sons was named Amnon and the daughter was named Tamar. David had multiple children. Anyway, this Amnon character, you know, I'm seeing him as a type of sin. I'm seeing him as a type of the enemy. I'm seeing him as a type of what the enemy wants to do to God's children. Right. And this daughter, Tamar, I see her as the child of God. The Bible says that she was a virgin and that she was very precious and beautiful and that the virgin daughters of the king would wear this coat that was various colors kind of like maybe the coat that Joseph would wear and it signified that they were virgins and that they had not been married at this point but the Bible says that Amnon had a love towards his sister is what it called it at first a love that was making him sick on the inside he loved her so much that he had to have her it was making him sick you know and he had another cousin of his that was related to David and, and, and his cousin said, man, why, why are you so sick? He said, I, I'm overwhelmed with love for my sister. <clears throat> Gotta have her. I, I can't live without her. I think about her all the time. It's just, I'm just infatuated. I got to have her. He said, well, don't be sick, man. Just tell the king that you are sick. Tell him you need her to come feed you so that you'll get better. So he called on David and he told David the deal and David, not knowing really what's going on, said, okay, that's fine. And she came in there and they bolted the door. And basically he told her what his plans were. And she said, oh, please don't do this. Please don't do this. If, if you'll just take your time and you go talk to the king, he'll probably just let me have you as his wife. You don't have to do this. But he didn't listen to her. And instead what he did was he forced himself on her. And then the Bible says that as quickly as he previously had loved her, all of a sudden he hated her with that amount of love that he had. He told his cousin, he said, open up the door, kick her. She was begging, please don't do this. Please, now you've, now you've shamed me, don't do this. And he said, open the door, and he kicked her out onto the street, and he bolted the door after her. Mm. She took the clothing that she was wearing, and she ripped it. I began to see in that story, and I saw it for a long time, that that's exactly how Satan is. He allures us and he promises us all kinds of things, right, that are just everything's going to be so beautiful and you're just going to love it so much and it's just going to make you feel so good. And the reality of it is, is that when we open up the door and we walk in and we allow ourselves to become part of that sinfulness, it ends up becoming to the place where it begins to destroy us. It tries to destroy us to the point where we feel unworthy, like she felt unworthy to wear that garment of clothing that it said that she was a virgin. But I'm here to tell you right now. Now that God has a different story. Yes, yes. See, that's what sometimes the, a person has to come to the place in their life where sin takes its toll on us to the point where we realize we don't want that anymore. And that instead what we want is the Lord. Yes. 
We want the resurrection life that he provides. And I can think of no better story, and I know I've preached it many a times, than the story of Naaman the leper. And in that story of Naaman the leper, the Bible says that he was a great and he was a mighty man. He was a general for the king of Syria. The Bible talks about the fact that in one of the skirmishes one day, there was a little girl that was from Israel and she was caught up in the skirmish. And Naaman brought her home to his house to care for her with his wife and to do housework. And I just see this little girl, Naaman, uh, this little girl, and I've, I love this story. She's walking around, she's flitting around. I can see her with her little dress. She's just all happy, picking flowers, doing whatever the, the, the lady wants. And, and, and then she says, oh, would that my Lord, talking about Naaman, would it be able to see the prophet of Israel? Mm -hmm. Oh, because if he'd see the prophet of Israel, he would be cured of his leprosy. I see this little girl as a type of us, type of the church, a type of believers in Christ that are filled with the love of God, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, that have a love story to tell, that want to tell somebody out there Amen. that's hurting and full of leprosy, that there's a God in heaven that loves them. Right. And she told the story and named it for a moment, got a glimpse of hope. Now he wrote a letter, they wrote a letter to, to the king of Israel and he's like freaking out. He tears his clothes. What do they think I am? They think I'm God? How am I going to heal this man? And he's all stressed out and he tells the prophet, he said, he tells the prophet, what am I going to do? And the prophet says, no, you just tell him to come on down here. And so he ends up telling, he ends up coming down there and, and the prophet tells him, he says, what you, this is what you need to do. You need to go to the Jordan River. And you need to dip in the Jordan River seven times. But you know what that man said? You know what Naaman said? He said, the Jordan? Aren't the rivers of Syria, Abana, and Farpar much more beautiful than this? You know, the plan of God just doesn't make sense sometimes to people's minds. That 2,000 years ago, a 33 and a half year old Jewish man would die on two pieces of wood outside a city called Jerusalem, but yet for 2,000 years, people have believed it and they've received eternal life. Yeah. Sometimes people just hear that story and they don't want to believe it. They don't want to have nothing to do with it. And Naaman was the same way. Right, right. Oh, I thought he was going to come out here and wave his hand. And, you know, and that's literally what it says. I get a picture. I'm not going to get in there. <laughs> wave his hand. And next thing you know, I'm healed. <laughs> no. You're going to go and you're going to dip into Jordan. Yeah. You're going to do it God's way or you won't do it at all. I've been telling people this for a long time. God's not going to change his plan for that's you, right. folks. Right. He's not going to change his plans for this big old thing that we call the church that's moving in a direction altogether different than what he has written in his word. Big light chandeliers, golden chairs, oh, big old crowds, and let's just tell a message that makes everybody feel better. That's not the right way the, the, war, the Lord wrote it, and that's not the way the Lord's going to give it. He's got one way, and it's the only way you're going to go dip in the Jordan seven times because seven is the number of God's fulfillment and when Jesus died on the cross he said it is finished. Amen. The Bible says when Naaman went and did what the Lord, what the prophet told him to do, that when he came out the water that seventh time his skin was like the skin of a baby. Skin of a young child. Free of disease. And when I came, when I said all of that for this, is that what the devil wants to make you feel like that little girl tomorrow. He wants to make you feel all beat up. He wants to make you feel dirty. He wants to make you feel unworthy. But I got good news. Yes. God brings new life. Oh, he brings new life just like Naaman had that new skin. God brings new life.